Hello and welcome to Middleware Friday for November 2nd, 2018. This is episode 79. And today what we're going to talk about is data transformations using Power Query and Microsoft Flow. Now, if you haven't seen the announcement, I guess it was probably about a month ago, we announced the public preview of Power Query integration for Microsoft Flow. So I'm including the link to the blog post. Feel free to go ahead and check it out and uh, see some additional details that may not be captured as part of this recording. So for those of you who may not be familiar with Power Query, it is a data connection technology that enables you to discover, connect, combine, and refine data sources to meet your analysis needs. Now, if it sounds like a familiar tool, that's for good reason. It is available or has been available for quite some time in both Excel and Power BI. So if you've ever used the Get Data dialog inside of Power BI, this is actually using Power Query. So as you can see, there's many different data sources where you can actually pull data into your data model, then perform some level of transformation across those uh, different data attributes. You have these different steps and stages, and it is a quite powerful tool and naturally we wanted to take advantage of this inside of Microsoft Flow. So how do you find this inside of Microsoft Flow? Well, today it is part of the SQL Server connector. So you will see a, an action called SQL Server Transform Data using Power Query. And you have the ability to click on that action and basically will display uh, an experience inside of the Flow Maker Portal where you can go ahead and create and edit your Power Query queries. As, as mentioned, this is a new action inside of SQL, the SQL connector, and we get a lot of questions as to why, and, it, and it's valid. I think the more data sources you have included in Power Query, the more compelling an offering it is. What we were up against is uh, our DLP policies. So we deal with a lot of customers, and there's always concerns about data leakage, and data loss prevention is one of our tools that allows organizations to prevent data leakage. And with Power Query and some of the data sources not actually being connectors that exist inside of Flow itself, we would essentially be creating a, a new gate that uh, basically data could flow in and out of without it being under the constraints of DLP. So this is, is something that we will need to attack going forward and to figure out how we can address this problem so that there isn't any sort of data leakage, but this explains why for now it is just part of the SQL connector. And certainly part of the reason for being included in the SQL connector is in the past, filtering data was a little bit difficult inside of SQL. One of the options was OData, and, and for some of our users, that wasn't an experience that was up to par. So we feel that using a more user-friendly and even more powerful approach like Power Query is the right solution. Now Power Query does leverage the Power Query online service. So when you use Power BI desktop, that is using Power Query essentially in a desktop mode. Here we're using a service. This is the same service that gets used for ingesting data into CDS, if you want to use Power Query from that perspective. So naturally there will be a subset of features as the Power Query team continues to invest in the online service. Another feature or constraint, depends how you look at it, is today we're only returning a single query. So you can have se several different queries inside of your, your Power Query mashup. Only one of those queries gets returned to flow. Uh, there's a few different reasons for this. I won't go into a whole lot of details, but you still have the ability to aggregate multiple queries and have a single query. So I think this is, is less of a concern, but it's just something you need to be aware of. And I'll show you a little bit more in the demo. So why did we build this? Uh, so as I mentioned before, a more approachable uh, solution for filtering and shaping. It also lays the foundation and unlocks future Power Query integrations. So now that we've figured out how we can integrate the two services, this is now where we can build on top of it and actually try to include more and more data sources. And as Power Query makes investments, we can attempt to bring those into the Flow ecosystem as well, where it makes sense. And I think what this also does is it unlocks this notion of data transformations inside of Flow. So Microsoft Flow doesn't have data mappers per se outside of, you know, populating a connector action 
or an attribute within an action like from a previous output. That's like our level of, of data mapping. Naturally, in the enterprise, you're going to have some more complicated uh, scenarios, and we feel like Power Query is a good option to start to solve those data transformation problems inside of Flow. Okay, so let's do a quick walkthrough, and then I'll show you a demo. Here I'm in Microsoft Flow. Naturally, I just have a button trigger uh, just to uh, you know to kick this flow off. You can type in transform, and or I could type in Power Query as well, and then we'll see this specific action show up. So let's go ahead and click it. Now, because I have a connection already established, this automatically just shows up for me. Um, otherwise, it's the same connection experience. There's nothing new. Um, from this perspective, you have an, an existing connection and then you can build Power Query on top of it. One thing to know, we do have a limitation around shared connections. So if you try to use just any, you know, connection that has been shared in the past, perhaps from Power Apps, that is going to basically stall out or fail when you try to use Power Query. So it is in public preview. It is something we'll fix. But for now, make sure you have a clean connection that isn't shared. And I think you'll have a a more predictable experience. So here I'm going to go ahead and use, uh, let's just delete this. We'll use an existing connection, which I know is going to connect to an Azure SQL database. This, uh, we did have a bug related to the on-premise data gateway. It is being fixed right now. It's actually being shipped. Uh, so depending upon when you watch this video, that bug will likely be fixed at that point. But for now, I'm going to be connecting to Azure SQL. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to click a query. And because I've provided my connection details, which would include the SQL Server database and the SQL, um, the SQL Server and the SQL Server database, uh, or the SQL Server instance, it'll be able to iterate all of the different tables that exist as part of that database itself. So in this scenario, we're going to want to bring in our apartments, our customers, and our work orders. We'll talk about this in the demo itself, but we essentially want to um, link these tables together or join them so that we've got this like composite data source. And so what we'll do is we'll include these three tables in our Power Query um, experience. So here, these are the three queries. Now, as mentioned, only one of them can be returned. That is why we see two question marks here, because this one will have enable load selected. If I wanted to return work orders, I would click enable load here, and that would return the work orders um, query. And basically you can see that now apartments is italicized. But what we can do, we wanna get data from all three of these different tables um, as part of our result set. So what we can do is combine tables and say uh, merge queries as new. So we will now start off with our work orders table. And what we wanna do is be able to link work order data to the apartment um, where the work needs to be done and then also link the customer who has requested the work to be done. So what we'll do is we'll choose work orders and then we will go ahead and choose apartments and then we need to link these up. So we're going to say this is a left join and we want to essentially enrich this data set, the work orders data set, with the apartment detail. So let's click apartment ID, apartment ID and click OK. What's going to happen is a new query is actually uh, formed here. So let's go ahead and rename this query. And we'll call this work orders and apartment, right? And now what we can do, since once again, we can only return one query, we can go ahead and merge this one. So we'll hit, uh, we'll go ahead and select it and then say merge queries as new. And we will take our new work orders and apartments query and we will merge it with customers. Now the difference, same thing, uh, left join. What we're going to do this time though is we are going to join these based upon the customer ID, which is here. So let's select customer ID, select customer ID, click OK. Now let's rename this and we will rename it work orders. Really descriptive. Let's make sure that we expand these different tables so that we have access to all of the data. And let's ensure that this is the query that's going to be loaded. Now, we're not quite done yet. Much like you've seen in Power BI, where you have all of these different applied steps, we can go ahead and do further 
um, transformations or filters if we want. So for example, let's go up and say manage columns because we don't need to return some of these redundant columns. So for example, we have apartment ID here, we have apartment ID here, we don't need to return both of them. Uh, similarly, uh, customer ID is here, customer ID is here, we don't need to return both. Uh, we're not also interested in row version, that's not interesting for us. So let's go ahead and click OK. So now we've got our, our query loaded that we want to return. We've got all of our steps in place. If we wanted to go back and redo them, we could go ahead and X them out. And basically, uh, you don't lose all of that previous work. So now we can go ahead and click Create. Now what's happening at this point is now Flow understands the data set that's going to be returned. And it is a type data set, which is exactly what we want. We don't want to be parsing and having to try to figure all of this stuff out. So for example, if we wanted to create an item inside of SharePoint, now what we'll see is we've got access to all of these different data attributes that are coming from Power Query. So in the past, you probably would have had to write some, some ugly SQL, uh, T-SQL in order to join these different tables. Uh, for some of our like power users or citizen devs, you know, that may not have been a great experience, but here they were able to just point and click and do some pretty powerful transformations in order to wire this up. Uh, so, so this is, that's sort of the walkthrough. Let's just see this in action. So along this theme of apartments, uh, naturally you have these work orders that get created when there's work that needs to be done. You know, perhaps someone's sink isn't working or there's like a window that's broken or whatever. Um, you go ahead, you call the apartment uh, manager, they log a ticket. And now what happens is the apartment manager wants to detect customer sentiment. Um, within the comments that they're getting um, when these work orders are created. Perhaps they're created through an online form or through email. And now you want to be able to analyze this to detect which are the customers who might be upset so that you can proactively deal with those um, in order to prevent them from leaving because they get so frustrated with your service that they just move on. So this is the flow itself. And for this scenario, we've got this kicked off in a you know as a recurrence basically on a schedule what we're doing here is we're, we're creating an array an empty array of our customer our angry customers uh, we will then go ahead and use that same power query query that i just showed you before now what we're going to go ahead and do though is we're going to loop through the result set and we're going to pass in their customer comments to the sentiment analysis engine the azure cognitive services if their score is less than 40 so 40% uh, essentially between zero and one, uh, then we will consider them an angry customer. And all we're gonna do is we are going to essentially uh, append a record to that array that we defined earlier. So here we've got their customer details, the name of the apartment, the work order description. So this is the power of bringing in those three different tables together. And now we've got a composite data set that we can actually use. We'll also include the sentiment score. And then if there are any records, we'll check the length of this angry customer array. And if there are records, then we'll go ahead and do is we'll create an HTML table based upon that array of angry customers. And then we're gonna simply post a message to a Microsoft team. And so what we'll do is we'll just go ahead and test this. So as you can see, the Power Query execution didn't take too long. It took three seconds for us to go ahead and run that query. And now our flow, well, it's almost completed. It's completed now. So if we head over to Teams, and this is the web version, uh, we can see a new record has just been populated. And here we can see the apartment, the customer name, their email address, and their comments. So again, really, why? We can see that's got a low sentiment of, of 0.17. Now, please fix this. This is the third time this month, 0.23. And then someone said, sigh, um, obviously expressing their frustration. And so we can now capture the sentiment. So these would be good customers to follow up with personally in order to try to change them from being a, detra a detractor to a promoter. And this is something that you can have automatically done where you're not actually creating additional processes or additional manual work to try to read every single comment to figure this out. So I hope you enjoyed this episode of Middleware Friday. Uh, Steph Jan will be up next week. So take care, have a good weekend, and thanks for watching.